Medieval Europe, 1350. Europe is within the throes of a chaotic century. France is losing ground in the Hundred Years' War with England. The Holy Roman Empire, under its nice solid outside, is a mess of internal conflicts. And the Ottoman Turks push westward into Europe, as Byzantium is falling. On top of all of this, the Black Death has recently ravaged Europe, church corruption is at an all-time high, and the popes no longer see Rome as their home. Do, 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 do. Around a half century ago, the seat of the Pope was moved to the city of Avignon from his traditional home of Rome. To make a long story short, this was because a personal bestie of the King of France was elected Pope after two of the previous Popes conveniently died within eight months of each other. The Papal Curia, which was the Papal Court, was moved to the city of Avignon. This was so that the French King and the new Pope could hang out with each other on the weekends. This move closer to France increasingly intertwined the interests of the Holy See and the French Crown. Most Cardinals thereafter elected were French, Decisions typically favored the French, and appointments of beneficies, which are church lands and titles, typically were given to, you guessed it, the French. Or you know, whoever paid the most money for it. Being so far removed from their traditional papal lands in Italy began to take its toll on Italian church authority, and the city-states started to see the papacy less as the embodiment of God and more as foreign overseers. Meanwhile, the church in Avignon was richer than ever. It would sell pretty much anything, from dispensations for consanguinity, because, let's be real, what's more medieval than marrying your cousin? To selling off dioceses to the highest bidder, or the highest bidder's not nose kid. There was even a special tax for crusades, but these crusades rarely ever actually happened. This was just kind of a workaround to allow rulers to collect church taxes for themselves, since normally church taxes would go to the Pope. Naturally, this was blatantly corrupt. All of this didn't really help the image of our now non-Roman see. One of the main reasons the Papal Curia was resistant to moving back to Rome was because Rome was, as they said back in the day, kind of a shithole. For context, the population of Rome was 50,000 before the Black Death, and dwindled to a mere 20,000 afterwards. Classical monuments, tumbled by earthquake or neglect, were vandalized for their stones. Cattle were stabled in abandoned churches. Streets were pitted with stagnant pools and strewn with rubbish. Contrast this with Avignon, which was far more accessible to visitors from all over Europe, estimated to have around four times the population and featured extensive papal palaces, castles, moneylenders, and a university. The popes of Avignon invested a lot in the city, and it showed in extravagance. Much to the disappointment of most of the papal curia, popes were always being pressured by both internal church forces and by outside influences to return to the Roman see in order to maintain legitimacy. Not to mention that they wanted to hold on to that sweet, sweet income from their rich city-state vassals. Unfortunately for them, this brought them directly in conflict with the Visconti, badassedly referred to as the Vipers of Milan. Now, the Visconti kind of deserve an entire video on their own, but we'll keep it brief. Two brothers rode Lombardy in concert. Galeazzo and his brother, Bernabo. Between them, these two Italiano heavyweights fought wars throughout their entire lives to expand the borders of Milan. They also found time to father a stupid amount of children. Bernabo alone had 17 legitimate children with his wife, and 20 illegitimately. That's a lot of child support. They used this abundance of progeny to intertwine themselves within the courts of Europe. Not only that, both Bernabo and Galeazzo were quite wealthy rulers, being lords of various prosperous cities within one of the most lucrative trading zones in Europe. Then, in 1356, seeing some easy pickings, Bernabo snatched up the prosperous city of Bologna and its surrounding lands from the Papal States. None too pleased about this, Urban V, the Pope at the time, excommunicated Bernabo for his various trespasses. He sent two Papal legates with a bull of excommunication to Bologna, which was now Bernabo's seat of power. Not one to be cowed. Bernabo listened calmly, and then forced the legates to eat the bull. The... the... In, the entire thing! It had silk ribbons and lead seals on it! Holy shit. Ahem, <clears throat> uh, he then sent them back to the Pope with a message. I would have you know that I am Pope, Emperor, and King in my own domains. God himself cannot do here what is contrary to my will. Your humble servant, Bernabo. Urban really didn't know what to do with this kind of defiance, and it took him about 10 years, but he finally worked up the courage to ask his not-so-close friend, the Holy Roman Emperor, for help. Hey, I know I don't call often, and that we're not on the best terms, but this guy, Bernabo Visconti, he's a real jerk. Can you maybe please take care of him for me? Charles IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, was like, fine, okay, I guess, but I'm gonna complain the whole time. He promptly marched right off to Bologna with an army, but when he got there, Bernabo was like, hey, how about I just pay you some money instead, and you just go home? Charles really didn't want to be here anyway, so he promptly took the money and marched his army right on back to Germany. 
Urban, being pretty old, couldn't take this kind of stress and died. There was a kind of temporary peace, a calm before the storm. The cardinals in Avignon convened to elect a new pope. One cardinal spoke into the silent room. Do you guys know what we need? We need a weak little bitch pope who won't try to take us back to Rome or waste any more money on this Italian nonsense. They all agreed, because they would much rather just chill in Avignon. They thereby elected Gregory XI, who likely had fibromyalgia and had, and I quote, no particular visible strength of character. Wow, imagine being hired for that. But oddly enough, being told that you're the literal mouthpiece of God will generally change a guy, and Gregory transformed overnight from little bitch to promptly wanting to resume reconquering old papal lands to make Rome safe for the return of the papal curia. Naturally, most of the French cardinals hated this and dragged their feet in the subsequent proceedings. Ignoring their pleas because he now spoke with the literal voice of God, Gregory planned. The Holy Roman Emperor clearly wasn't really interested in helping, so he decided to try to appeal to other sources for help. While he did have scatterings of private support from France, the king himself was more occupied with the seemingly endless Hundred Years' War than the Pope's seemingly endless struggles. He also received support from Savoy, a principality on the outskirts of France. Primarily, he decided to hire mercenary companies, most notably a John Hawkwood, a prestigious English nobleman who headed the infamous White Company, which had a reputation as one of the greatest and most ruthless companies of the late 14th century. Hawkwood was originally working for Bernabeu, under the command of a favorite son of Galeazzo, Gian, who was accompanied by two guardians who were instructed to not let him get killed in the fighting. After being ordered to take back the city of Asti from the Savoyards, the guardians interjected because it would have been too dangerous for the young Gian. Subsequently losing the siege, Bernabeu had the pay of Hawkwood's mercenaries in punishment. This caused Hawkwood to rage quit and switch sides. Gregory also hired lesser known mercenaries, almost all of them foreigners, in order to attempt to win back papal lands and contain the Milanese threat of the Visconti. And through all the spending, he made progress. Bologna was taken back from Bernabo, and various papal lands were regained. As his armies traversed Italy, they, as was standard practice back in the day, raided and burned villages and towns along the way. Naturally, nearby Italian city-states were getting angry about all of these foreigners traipsing about their neighboring lands. The most notable grievances came from those of the Tuscan League. The Tuscan League was a loose alliance of republican city-states headed by Florence, encompassing the traditional duchy of Tuscany. It was formed around a hundred years ago with the purpose of maintaining and protecting the sovereignty of each member's territory, and historically it had a rocky relationship with the papacy because the Pope saw all of central Italy as his rightful jurisdiction, which the League obviously disagreed with. Watching the Pope march troops everywhere and vacuum up lands near and around Tuscany didn't help matters. Either obliviously or provocatively, the Pope sent emissaries to the Tuscan League to demand financial support for the campaign against Bernabo, because hiring all these mercenaries was getting really expensive, and since the Florentines were traditional rivals of the Milanese, they might be willing to help out. However, just as his emissaries were conducting negotiations, news arrived that Gregory secretly made a truce with Bernabo Visconti. To make the situation even more treacherous, the Pope simultaneously released the troops under John Hawkwood from service while they were marching not far from the city of Florence. This army of now unemployed, unpaid, and unaffiliated mercenaries naturally set their eyes on the wealthy city of Florence. The Florentines were pissed. What was before just a distrust of the papacy turned swiftly into hatred as the city panicked. They saw the situation as the Pope trying to swindle money out of them just as he made peace with their enemy, while letting his dogs loose upon their city. This was complete and utter treachery, and the only response the Florentine people saw was war upon the papacy. Join me next time as we dive into the War of the Eight Saints and the beginning of the Western Schism. Hello, internet people. Just a quick disclaimer, this was my first real attempt at a YouTube video, so if you have any friendly tips or suggestions, please let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Now we have some theme music for like about two seconds, maybe. Hey, Barnabio, come over here. I've got something to talk to you about. Eh, uh, not now, Galeazzo. Can you not see? I'm up deep in this bitch trying to add a 37 child to our dynasty. But Barnabio, the Pope is in the home and the Holy Roman Emperor is off a chalk off somewhere. Let's go take over Bologna.